All right, my friends, instead of three big stories today, we have 11 big stories. And I have to cover all 11 big stories because if I don't cover these stories, you're not seeing the complete picture and getting the context that you need to understand what's happening in Ukraine and in the world writ large with the struggle between democracy and autocracy that is currently underway. Okay, so we're going to start here. Russian ammunition depot in Tikhoresk. Krasnodar region was destroyed tonight as a result of Ukrainian attack. I talked about this at some length in my earlier video. video. Um, it's it's really hard to deny something like this that can be seen by from space. But again, I talked about here in a daily brief. Please go back and look at that if you want to hear more about this um, pretty significant strike on the Ukrainians part. Okay. This is part of Ukraine's victory strategy, and I think that's a spot on. This is exactly right. This is why you're seeing this happen in the weeks leading up to Zelensky's meeting with Biden, because he's proving, see what we can actually do. Now, if we had your stuff, we could do more. In two days, Russia has lost the ammunition capacity to wage an intense war for four months. I don't know if it's four months or how much longer, but that is a significant attack, right? So Zelensky is going to be meeting with Biden on the 26th of September, and that's what he's going to be putting forward. We have the ability to do this. We just need your aid to be able to do this with greater weapons than what we have the capacity to do right now. We can take this fight to them, and all we need is that help. Okay, so to that point, the U.S. is now considering sending medium-range missiles to Ukraine for F-16s. The joint standoff weapon with a range exceeding 70 miles may soon be part of the Ukraine's arsenal. And the U.S. So they need attack them, they need this, they need longer-range weapons so that they can... Now, what's happened here is in the delay, in Biden's delay of doing this, and I'm not picking on Biden, I'm just saying he's the guy that can make the decision... In this delay, the Russians have backed things up, so they need things that can strike even further in order to really take this fight, but they've proven that they're able to do this. Okay, next big story. So that's first, second, second, third, second, wh whichever. Um, President Zelensky denies the information from the Wall Street Journal, allow according to which 80,000 Ukrainian soldiers died in the war with Russia. He said uh, to journalists that the real losses are significantly lower. Okay, so here's the actual article. Well, no, this is an article from uh, UA Wire about the Wall Street Journal article, but it's still giving the same fact set. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has labeled a recent report by the Wall Street Journal claiming that the uh, Ukraine has suffered 80,000 losses on the front as false. Wall Street journalists, uh, Wall Street Journal journalists have asserted that the total casualties for the Ukraine and Russia purportedly reached 1 million people. Zelensky emphasized that the media highly overestimated the defense forces' losses. So they're saying it's much less. Okay, uh, 80,000, that's a lie. The real figure is much lower than what was published significantly, Zelensky told reporters on Friday. Now, 80,000 is not bad comparatively. And here's another article in uh, Ukransky Pravda talking about the same fact set. 80,000 killed, 400,000 injured in Ukraine. Russian losses estimates vary with some saying 200,000 dead and 400,000 wounded. Now, what's important to my ear when, I, when I'm listening, reading about this, I'm just going, wait a minute. Okay, 80,000 and 400,000 as opposed to 200 and 400,000. Let's take off the table the issue that Zelensky had about 80,000 is too high. Let's say that that's right. And I'm not saying that it is, but let's just for sake of argument say that it is. The real story here is 80,000 times five is 400,000. So there's a multiple of one to five for a Ukrainian casualty where 200,000 times two is 400,000. There's a multiple of uh, only one to two. So every one ca Russian that dies, there's two off. The so, okay, let's back up for a second. So you have about one dead for every about three wounded, generally speaking, let's say, give or take. It's one to two for the Russians. They don't really take care of their dead so well. So maybe that's what drives up their dead numbers. Maybe that's it. And then it's one to five for the Ukrainians because they are really trying to take care of their people and they're very, they're more cautious and, and try to get them care sooner. I think that's the story there with those numbers, not the, that it's not 80,000, it's lower. Maybe it is. I, I don't know, but that's something to consider. 
Okay, next story. To, or well, this is a continuation. It's part of the next story, but it's also a continuation. Those numbers are going to drive us to uh, Russia is needing to mobilize. And I went through the math yesterday about how Russia needs to mobilize, and they, they don't want to do it, but they're going to have to, and it's going to be very hard. Uh, they're going to need to mobilize to make up the losses from last year and the extra 180 that they're trying to put into the army. More than half a million people. Now, two years ago, the first major unannounced mobilization began in Russia. It created uh, streams of refugees from Russia, a shortage of personnel, and most importantly, it took the lives of almost a million Russians. Not a million Russians. That's a little bit more, that's saying more than what's actually happened. It took the lives of hundreds of thousands of Russians, um, and it may take the lives of a million Russians before this is all done, if this keeps going. But I don't, I think that that estimate is way too high. But it did create streams of refugees from Russia. Uh, and so a million Russians or so are out of the country. That's about fair. And they're now having a labor shortage as a consequence of that. Uh, you have working age men out of, you lost a million out of your 140-ish something million. That's, that's, that's hard. Okay. Um, Okay, mobilization in Russia remains unlikely in the near to medium term due to Putin's personal fear. He's terrified of a color revolution and becoming the next Gaddafi, and uh, he does not want to do it. So he's looking for back channels to, to be able to get there. But there's a protest rally today held near the building of the Russian Defense Ministry in Moscow. Exactly two years ago, the authorities announced mobilization. And like these people protesting, good on them. Like you, you've people have been arrested for holding up a blank piece of paper. So to be doing this takes some real guts. So, okay. Mobilization in Russia is not currently on the agenda, says Peskov. Well, according to Darth Putin, on this day in 2022, after denying it would happen, we mobilized cat and fodder to die for my palaces. I'm, I remain a master strategist. Yeah, it happened. So that he's saying it's not on the agenda now, I wouldn't put a lot of credence in that. Okay. Let's switch gears to the next big story. Russian military circles say that Gerasimov is preparing for a tough conversation with Putin. You think? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've i never seen such an underestimated st statement in my life. This is going to be very hard. Sources say that the president of Russia is scheduled to meet with the chief of the general staff in mid-October, during which Gerasimov will have to present his plan for conducting a, quote, special military operation, unquote, for the end of 2024 and the whole of 2025. So if you think this will be done by Christmas, I don't think that's the case. I don't think the Russians think it's the case. If it, it may not be done by next Christmas. I mean, like people that have been spreading this false hope that it's going to be over soon. I don't, I don't, just don't see it. The conversation will obviously be tough. Karazimov is expected to report on the events in Russia's Kursk region, as well as the exact terms for the complete liberation of the entire Donbass from the armed forces of Ukraine. Well, that's a tough sell too, because it was two years ago and about three weeks, a month, something like that, that Putin gave the order to have the uh, entire borders of Donbass within two weeks. And so that happened two years ago and about three weeks or a month, something like that. If Gerasimov gives unconvincing answers to Putin's uh, questions. His fate will be sealed and he will definitely lose his post in the foreseeable future. I don't know. Maybe he'll keep him. Maybe he won't. Uh, you know, Putin can't, can't really, he has to, okay, he's in an authoritarian system and he has to rely on uh, loyalty, not competence. And while Gerasimov is more competent than, say, Shoigu, he's still, uh, you know, he can't afford to lose loyalty. Like, who else is he going to pick? Think about the rash of all the Russian generals that have been out lately. Uh, it's it's a real tough bind for them. Switching gears to the next big story, we're looking at Iran and Hezbollah and Israel. And this comment was, I wonder, should we thank Israel? Because the headline here is, Iran withheld launchers for missiles sent to Russia, sources say. Okay, let's just look at that. So it's a double-edged sword for the Russians. Any time that they can take, you know, use Iran or other proxies, um, what's going on with Israel and Palestine and Hezbollah, any time that they can, you know, gin that up somewhere else, the U.S. has taken their eyes off it. But that's helping Russia. But if they're not getting the supplies from Iran that they otherwise would have gotten into Russia, then they're also losing a little bit in that sequence as well. 
Okay. Media reports that the Taliban have applied to participate in the BRICS summit, which will be held in Kazan from October 22nd to 24th. Also, according to the media, Palestine will participate in the BRICS summit. It's so interesting to my mind because there's like this realignment in the world of democracies and autocracies. And it looks very much like what it looked like when it was the Soviet Union versus the free world. I mean, it's it's lining up in that kind of way. Now, maybe Brazil should turn red or something and, and join this crowd over here. But really, it's starting to look like that, isn't it? Okay, Darth Putin. Um, before I read what he has to say, this is Heidi Matthews saying, very bad idea to prosecute Russia for aggression. But she's also saying that for Netanyahu, the appropriate response is uh, to accuse war criminals. And so she's saying, do it to them, not do it to here. And so Darth Putin, the parody account, say, prosecuting Russia for crimes of aggression is a very bad idea. Prosecuting Israel for crimes is the appropriate response. We oppose Western imperialism and we appease Russian imperialism. Well, that's what that amounts to. Okay. Israel defense defenses are currently now this was a few hours ago currently trying to intercept Hezbollah missiles and that's what you're seeing up there the the Iron Dome kind of something um, and that's been going on for some time by the time you're watching this it may not be still happening uh, John Spencer talking about the pagers now I interviewed John Spencer's in the in the first few days of the war when I still had my leadership. Um, a YouTube channel that I was doing that kind of thing. And I just started talking about Ukraine, 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 Ukraine. And I finally separated and just started this channel independently just to talk about Ukraine. But I interviewed him about urban warfare and he's an expert. He's a, the head of the urban warfare center at West Point. Um, and he said this historic and unprecedented in its impact, the pager walkie talkie attack physically and psychologically. Hezbollah can't trust a single piece of their equipment. It will go in the history books, sheer scale across such a geographic terrain and instant, instantly precise, discriminate in mass. I mean, it, it was artful in what was happening. But we've also just crossed some kind of weird threshold in which, like after the atomic bomb being dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, we, we were in a different era in history. And I think that happened here because those people that who would do harm as T, and you know, if you watch what I'm talking about, when I say T, those people could target civilians all over the place with this same kind of process. And we're just in a new age. It's, it's kind of scary. Okay. So Sergei Simoleni was talking about this. Having killed Hezbollah using modified pagers, Israel hasn't violated the protocol on landmines or booby traps. And he explains why in this thread going on and on, unpacking what's happened exactly, um, you know, what the protocol says and what they did there. He's right. They didn't violate it. But he concludes with this, looking from the following, look from the following perspective. The protocol's goal is to protect civilians. Therefore, bands booby trapping objects which look harmless especially those you are used amid harmless or emotionally loaded situations kitchens funerals etc but it's weird to say that bands for example putting a mine into a car or other device used by targeted uh, combatants if one wants to target a t who hides amid civilians one cannot just bomb a quarter it will cause a lot of deaths but one can put a low load mine into his mobile phone so the only the, the chance only he will be killed is extremely high and collateral damages are almost excluded. Now there were collateral damages, no doubt, but that's what the intent was. And th this is why um, this actually worked as it did. But again, we've crossed this weird threshold over the last couple of days where we're in a new era and there, there, there will be bad things that happen to innocent civilians because they'll learn from what Israel did. And that's unfortunate, but this is the way of the world. Hezbollah's main chain of command has been almost completely dismantled after a dozen significant T, including Ibrahim Aquil, I talked about him yesterday, were eliminated. Now, uh, I said he was, I think, second in command. Well, he's kind of like a vice president. He's on the second chain of command, but there's a few of them there, and this is Aquil. Okay, so, and they're, you know, they've gone after a lot of this crowd, so... Yeah, that's what that's what's happening there. Okay, next big story. TikTok, and I'm surprised by this because Facebook, I understand. YouTube, I would understand. TikTok has deleted the accounts of propagandists Sputnik International, Sputnik Serbia, Sputnik Africa, and all the other Sputnik channels. 
This came amid U.S. accusations that the propagandists interfered in the elections, RT complained. Meta had previously deleted all of RT's Instagram and Facebook accounts with the ability to restore them or appeal the decision. So, yeah, TikTok's going after them. That's interesting. So there's the war. There's like the hot war. There's there's all kinds of things going on there. Then there's the uh, information war. And then there's um, like mining. This mi It's going to take 100 years to completely demine the territory of Ukraine using traditional methods. And then there's uh, economic war that's going to have some impact. This is Jason J. Smart. It always starts with sharp increases in the use of the term soft landing. So this is Bloomberg. Uh, this is compiled by Bloomberg, looking at all the times people talking about a soft landing from what's going on in the economy, and it ends in a crisis. Upsurge of the phrase soft landing foreshadowed the economic recession. So here, you had a recession in 1990. You had the re the, the um, tech bubble in 2000. You had the uh, housing bubble in 2008, 2009. You had uh, the COVID in two uh, 2020. And here we are again. Yep. We're on, so there's going to be some kind of economic problems shortly. I don't know how shortly it's going to be, but it's very likely that that's going to happen. So there's an economic war, then there's also just information war. So Michael McFall says, I've seen some outrageous propaganda from the MFA Russia in recent years, but this one ranks as one of the worst. The deep decay in the late Putin empire era is palpable. Embarrassed for Russian diplomats who know the actual story of World War II. Well, they put this out, and I was checking to make sure this wasn't a parody account when I first saw it. Um, they put this out and they said on September 17th, this was just a couple days ago, they put this out. The Red Army launched a military operation in Poland. Yeah, that was on the other side where they divided up the country between uh, the Nazis and the Soviets. But they said this in Poland, preventing the genocide of the population of Western Belarus and Western Ukraine. That's not why they did it. And there was a community note below that. Uh, the Soviet operation in Poland had nothing to do with preventing genocide. The Soviets invaded Poland alongside the Nazis as part of the secret Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, during which the Nazis and Soviets established spheres of influence and agreed to share Poland. But they're still putting this out today. That, I mean, this was a very recent thing, just within the last few days. Okay. Okay, we'll end with Darth Putin saying, at this point, I must remind my anti-imperialist serfs that we oppose Western arms to Ukraine as an escalation, but we appease North Korean arms to Russia as necessary price to combat U.S. globalism. Oh, okay, my friends, that's all that I have today. That's 11 big stories. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the likes. When you click like, you help this spread, and I appreciate it. Thank you for the shares. Thank you for the subscribes, and thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.